Hello YouTube. In this video I want to talk about philosophical consensus. Uh, pretty much everybody who engages with philosophy uh, holds positions that are in the minority uh, among the relevant experts. Um, some of us hold a lot of minority positions. If we take the 2020 Phil Papers survey, um, here are some of, of uh, some positions that are in the minority. Um, so the question is, uh, for those of us who hold such positions, how should we respond when we find that these positions are rejected by the consensus of philosophers? Um, I mean, you know, presumably philosophers are the relevant experts with respect to uh, most of these types of positions. Uh, so, you know, what, what weight does philosophical consensus have? Um, I mean, obviously the problem here is that in the vast majority of these cases, it seems that other philosophers will be uh, just as well acquainted with the same evidence and arguments as me, and they're just as intelligent as me, you know, they're just as good at doing philosophy as I am. Indeed, many of them are better. Is it rational for me to continue to hold a particular philosophical position when I find that there is a consensus of philosophical experts who reject that position? Um, and a bit, so, yeah, this is this is a problem that is uh, something that pretty much every philosopher is going to have to reflect on because pretty much all of us hold some minority positions. So uh, in this video, I'm going to outline some of the possible responses to this. Uh, and broadly speaking, we can uh, divide these responses into three different types. I'm taking this taxonomy from Brian Francis's article, Is it rational to reject expert consensus? OK, so a first type of response is uh, the Morian response, and this uh, is inspired by G. E. Moore's response to external world scepticism. Um, so just to remind you a bit of that, the external world sceptic denies that we have knowledge of the external world. So she denies that, for example, I know that I have hands. But what Moore says is, well, you know, if you take, take the proposition, I know I have hands. Well, surely that's more plausible than any philosophical premise that might be used by the skeptic. Um, you know, the proposition that I know I have hands, that's, that's just an obvious piece of common sense. Uh, it's much more plausible than any purely philosophical premise. So whenever the skeptic gives an argument for the conclusion that I don't know I have hands, we can just reverse the argument. We can just say, well, n no, I do know I have hands, so one of your premises is wrong. So it's like the skeptic has given an argument where she gives a bunch of premises, you know, premise one, premise two, premise three, etc. For the conclusion, um, you know, I do not know that I have hands. But then what we do is we just say, no, I do know I have hands, therefore one of those premises is wrong. And that's a much better argument than the skeptic's argument because we can be much more sure of the proposition that I know I have hands than, on a, than of any of the skeptic's propositions. Now, of course, this leaves us with the question of, well, where exactly does the skeptical argument go wrong? That's an interesting question, but uh, the point is, there's no sceptical challenge here. There's no threat to our knowledge. I know I have hands, so I know the sceptical argument goes wrong somewhere. Now, this type of argument, as I say, you know, Moore gave this as, an, as a response to external world sceptics, but other philosophers have started applying this type of argument um, in many other contexts as well. So in, the general move here is to say, well, um, you know, for some proposition P, right, P is, is more obvious, it's more warranted, it's more plausible than any premises that might be used in an argument against P. And, um, you know, in, in that case, we're justified in continuing to believe that P, uh, even if we can't identify exactly where the arguments against P go wrong. Um, and so, you know, the, so the Morian uh, response for the for minority positions might be to make this kind of move, right? Uh, we might say, well, the proposition that there is no free will, that's just obviously true. It's more plausible than any philosophical premise in an argument for the claim that there is free will, so the philosophical consensus can be dismissed. Isn't it, it might be an interesting question why so many philosophers have gone wrong, but I don't really need to answer that. I don't, you know, I don't need to identify what their mistake is. I know that they've made a mistake. Um, because you know, my like my proposition that there's no free will is much more plausible than any than any purely philosophical premise. Okay, so um, I I have a video on Moore's argument against skepticism. Um, suffice it to say, for now, I, I I don't find that argument particularly convincing. 
even as a response to external world scepticism. Um, but important thing to see here is that even if it does work against external world scepticism, it's extremely implausible, I think, as a move to reject philosophical consensus. Um, a key part of Moore's original argument is that we can identify certain common sense propositions. So there are certain propositions that basically every normal human being believes, at least prior to philosophical reflection. These propositions you know, guide our everyday behaviour, none of us ever face a situation which raises serious doubt about these propositions. I know that I have hands is an example, right? Like this is just a piece of obvious common sense. Um, that under the normal course of things, none of us would ever have a, a reason to question. Uh, so, you know, if if we can identify common sense propositions, then these are propositions that we can be more confident in than in any other type of proposition. Um, I, you know, I mean, certainly I'm more confident that I know I have hands than I am in you know, purely philosophical propositions. That's the, the basic idea of, of the Morian argument. So, you know, maybe the Morian argument works for common sense propositions, but it's, it seems much less obvious how to apply it for minority philosophical views. Um, if, we're, if we're defending a minority philosophical position, we're not in the realm of everyday common sense. You know, if I say that, uh, you know, that there's no free will, well, that's, that's not a common sense position. Um, you know, or, 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 or uh, you know, if I deny that there, anybody has any a priori knowledge, again, that, that's not part of everyday common sense. So, you know, Moore was able to contrast um, these the, the propositions of common sense with purely philosophical propositions. Obviously, that contrast isn't going to work here. So this probably isn't um, a, a particularly useful line of argument for defending minority philosophical positions. But, you know, it's worth it's worth mentioning uh, just as uh, just as uh, spell out all of the, the, the conceptual space, I guess. OK, so um, perhaps a more plausible move is um, is what we might call the dismissal response. And the dismissal response um, just basically just denies that a, that a response is really required. So if we're making this kind of move, what we'll say is that philosophical consensus is just uh, completely irrelevant to um, the evaluation of philosophical positions. So it doesn't actually require a response, you know. So, so like, um, you know, the fact that so-and-so, the fact that a certain number of people or that a certain group of people believe something, right, um, that's just irrelevant to the question of whether or not that thing is true. Um, so this isn't, you know, philosophical consensus isn't isn't an argument against my position. It's not something that, that therefore needs a response. Um, on, on learning that, that a particular position is rejected by most philosophers, uh, that's just not something um, that I need to, you know, process at all. Um, so on the dismissal response, right, I retain my belief and I just have no reaction to its minority status. So, <clears throat> I mean, on, on the one hand, you know, there is a kind of norm of like, like we, we uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's considered a fallacy to like appeal to authority. You know, the, the mere fact that um, a particular authority group uh, uh, endorse a, a position or reject a position, that, again, that's not in itself. That doesn't tell you whether or not that position is true. It's not, that doesn't seem to be evidence for whether or not it's true. On the other hand, th there's this worry that, well, this kind of sounds epistemically irresponsible. Um, you, you know, uh, like it, what's, What's puzzling about this, I suppose, is that we're trying to evaluate whether or not P is true. And if most of the experts in a field conclude that P is not true, then, I mean, even if we don't want to say that that is in itself evidence against P, um, it, it, it seems to suggest that maybe I'm missing something, you know, like maybe there's some evidence or some argument against P that I'm, I'm missing. Certainly, it seems to be some consideration against, against P. Um, you know, so it's like, well, what, why would it be the case that we're justified in ignoring philosophical consensus? Um, on the other hand, you know, this is, uh, I, I think, a fairly common attitude in philosophy. Um, a philosopher will find that lots of her colleagues disagree with her and she'll say, well, you know, this is just the way things are in philosophy. We, we disagree about all sorts of things. So it's to be expected that some of my philosophical views will be in the minority. Actually, you know, it would be quite surprising uh, if I didn't hold any minority positions. Philosophers disagree all the time. So, you know, um, this is just the way things work. Uh, it's it's not something we need to worry about. Actually, um, 
This kind of attitude, I sometimes saw this being expressed by people in response to the Phil Papers survey. Um, some people complained that surveys like this, which try to quantify what proportion of philosophers endorse particular positions, they complained, well, that's just the wrong way to think about philosophy, because the point of philosophy isn't about reaching a consensus. Um, so, you know, it, just doesn't ma it doesn't matter whether a particular position is held by 90% 90, 90 of philosophers or 10% of philosophers. Um, you know, you've got to evaluate, right, the arguments themselves, like the actual arguments for and against the position. Um, so, you know, uh, th there are these sort of two, like on, on the one hand, expert consensus seems to matter because I recognise that, you know, these people are just as intelligent as me, just as well acquainted with me. On the other hand, that's, that doesn't seem to be how philosophy actually works. So what do we say about this, right? What, can we say something to justify uh, ignoring philosophical consensus? Well, one rather extreme option here is to say that philosophy in general is just completely unreliable. Um, that there's no way of arriving at any justified philosophical views, there is no philosophical knowledge possible, um, so there's, there's no reason to put any weight on philosophical consensus um, because philosophers just have no expertise with respect to arriving at the truth. Now, um, you know, <laughs> the obvious problem with this position is that if we take this response, then you're going to undermine the justification for your own philosophical positions, right? So if you claim that there's no philosophical knowledge, there's no way of reliably getting at the facts with respect to philosophical questions, that does explain why you can ignore philosophical consensus, but it leaves your own philosophical position in an equally bad state. Um, so uh, we probably don't want to take this line if we're trying to you know, defend unpopular positions. Um, so another option is to say that philosophical consensus is uh, is misleading, right? We can ignore philosophical consensus because uh, it, it, philosophy doesn't produce the right kind of consensus um, to be like, you know, uh, uh, to have any sort of epistemic weight. What we usually find in philosophy is consensus on specific positions, but there's much less consensus on the arguments for those positions, and there's also very often no consensus on what exactly those positions are committed to. So let's take, for instance, external world scepticism. Philosophers generally agree um, on rejecting external world scepticism. They think that we do have knowledge of the external world. Um, but why, right? What, like, which arguments provide a convincing response to scepticism? Well, on that, there's enormous disagreement. And, you know, this matters because it's the arguments for a position that are supposed to justify it. So if philosophers can't agree on what counts as a good argument for their position, then that arguably undermines the epistemic relevance of the consensus. Uh, you know, it's, it seems like the consensus is almost, has almost occurred, like, by chance, or at least it's not being, you know, driven by convincing argument. Because, again, it's, um, you know, it's not like we all have a consensus that this particular argument provides a convincing refutation of scepticism. Um, the consensus is scepticism can be refuted, but, you know, actually we don't have any consensus on why. Um, and notice that this is unlike consensus in other fields. Scientists agree that anthropogenic global warming is occurring, and they largely agree on the mechanisms by which this occurs and the evidence for all of this. You could put together a sort of 101 document on the evidence for global warming where pretty much all climate scientists could look at it and say, yep, that evidence is convincing, right? Like that is what we take to be uh, convincing evidence for anthropogenic uh, climate change. And in fact, um, institutions regularly produce documents like that. I can't imagine that working with the uh, arguments uh, against external world scepticism. Like, could you get, you know, a bunch of philosophers together, um, you know, philosophers who reject scepticism together, and then get them to produce the sort of canonical uh, external world scepticism, arguments against external world scepticism, where they all agree that, yes, these arguments are convincing. Um, that seems, that seems much less likely, right? Um, so a, a, a similar problem is that <clears throat> there may not be much consensus on significant details of the position. So take uh, moral realism. There's a minor consensus in favour of moral realism. 62% of philosophers endorse moral realism, according to the full papers survey. But 
you know, really, whether we say there's a consensus here depends on how the views are classified, because that 62% is split among naturalist realists and non-naturalist realists. And these are actually very different positions. The metaphysical and epistemological commitments of naturalism and non-naturalism differ quite significantly. So if you ask, you know, well, what exactly are moral properties? How do we come to have justified beliefs about the moral properties? If you ask questions like that, you're going to get, um, you know, different answers from naturalists and non-naturalists. And those are important questions. I mean, like, like the, the, those are really significant aspects of their views. Um, so if we break down the options in, in just a slightly more fine-grained way, then it turns out there isn't actually uh, a, a consensus on any particular position. Um, and again, we can compare this to consensus in other fields. When scientists say that um, climate change is driven primarily by increased CO2 levels, well, they all mean the same thing when they talk about CO2. It's not as though some scientists think that CO2 is composed of atoms while others think that it's a continuous substance. You know, they agree on what this stuff is, they agree on how it works, they agree on how we know about it. Um, so what all of this might suggest is that philosophy doesn't generate the relevant kind of consensus. Um, and when the consensus is against my position, um, I'm, I don't really need to worry about that, um, you know, because it, it's 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 not yeah it, it, the the consensus that we have in philosophy, um, it's it's like just sort of by chance, right? We're not we don't really get consensus on um, what the convincing arguments are or on significant details of the position, and 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 that's what we would need for the consensus. To, to have like epistemic weight. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, this still leaves me with the question of, you know, how can it be appropriate for me to hold the minority position? Um, when we look at the proliferation of disagreement in philosophy, we, we might worry that this is just going to support the more extreme response that philosophy in general is just unreliable. Um, but, you know, the point here is just if we can kind of undermine consensus, then, then that undermines the specific challenge um, of philosophical consensus against my position. So that might be one uh, way to justify the dismissal move. Uh, here's a third way. Um, we might say that ignoring philosophical consensus is an important uh, epistemic or perhaps even moral ideal. Uh, this is suggested by Finna Delson in the article The Epistemic Value of Expert Autonomy. Uh, he talks about consensus in science, but um, I think similar ideas might be applied to uh, philosophy and other fields. Um, okay, so uh, there seems to be a general norm to philosophical inquiry that we don't defer to other philosophical experts when we are in a position to evaluate the evidence and arguments ourselves. There is a norm of epistemic autonomy, um, which Delson defines as follows. S is epistemically autonomous with respect to a proposition P to the extent that S's epistemic attitude to P is not directly influenced by other agents' epistemic attitudes to P. Uh, and so we, we think very often in philosophy that there's a kind of epistemic or moral obligation to be epistemically autonomous. At least, again, like when we are in a position to evaluate evidence and arguments, when we kind of enter into a debate ourselves, um, like we we ought to just look at the arguments and evaluate them without trying to you know fit our like match our beliefs to um, the beliefs of other philosophers. Uh, so that seems to be a norm, and Delson thinks that this is um, that this can be justified. And what justifies it is the value of independent evidence. So in general, a theory is better supported when the pieces of evidence in favour of it are unrelated than when those pieces of evidence are similar or closely related. If we're looking at CO2 concentrations over time, it's better to have five ice cores each taken from different places than five ice cores all taken from the same place, uh, or maybe even 20 ice cores all taken from the same place. Um, similarly, it's better to have five ice cores and five you know, tree rings than, uh, than 10 ice cores. Um, other things being equal, obviously. Uh, so other things being equal, it's better to have a variety of independent pieces of evidence. Um, you know, and, and so like, yeah, uh, uh, when, when it comes to, you know, I don't know, research teams gathering the evidence, um, it's better to have, you know, five pieces of evidence gathered by different research teams than, than it all being done by the same team, etc. Um, 
so the uh, philosopher William Hewell called this the consilience of inductions. Um, he says, I quote, that rules springing from remote and unconnected quarters should thus leap to the same point can only arise from that being the point where the truth resides. Uh, accordingly, the cases in which inductions from classes of facts altogether different have thus been jumped together belong only to the best established theories which the history of science contains. We don't just want more evidence. We want the pieces of evidence to be independent. Um, and this is also true for testimonial evidence. Suppose that there are 10 experts who all agree that some you know, proposition P in their domain of expertise is true. In one case, these 10 experts have never communicated with each other. None of them has any idea what the other has said. So these are 10 completely independent experts. They all come to the same conclusion that P. In the other case, there are 10 people on the same research team who have regularly shared ideas, maybe even with a view to producing a collaborative statement or something like that. Um, so, you know, we, in both cases, we have 10 people endorsing P. But it, other things being equal, it looks like the first case provides much better evidence for P. Um, I mean, it, after all, it's not really surprising that members of the same research team who've all been working together for a long time, who've all been exposed to you know, similar arguments, constantly communicating with each other, who are modifying their views in light of the views of other members, it's not surprising that they would come to the same conclusion. Um, but when you get 10 independent experts all coming to the same conclusion, OK, well, that's something to that, you know, like we want to pay attention to that. Um, so the reason, uh, the reason why um, we have a, uh, a norm of expert autonomy is to increase like the independence of expert judgments. Um, it's a method for increasing independence. In fields where experts are autonomous, there is greater independence of judgment than in fields where experts modify their judgments in light of the judgments of other experts. Um, and the reason why this is useful is that it means that when the experts do arrive at a consensus, that consensus is more trustworthy. Expert consensus is more reliable. Uh, it is of greater epistemic weight when the experts are independent. And epistemic autonomy promotes independence. Of course, this isn't going to work perfectly. Any person's views uh, uh, will, will be influenced in one way or another by the views of their colleagues. That's inevitable. But it's worth encouraging experts to try to be autonomous because this increases independence. Right. So that's that's the idea. Here's a concern about this. The value of expert autonomy explains why it's worthwhile to continue to defend unpopular positions in certain contexts. So if I'm writing a, an article for a philosophy journal, I should consider the arguments on their own merits. But our question is whether it's rational to believe unpopular positions. Now, Delson says that the value of expert autonomy does not extend to belief. Uh, he draws a distinction between belief and acceptance. When I believe some proposition P, I take P to be true. On the other hand, when I accept P, I adopt a policy of acting and thinking as if P were true in particular contexts. Uh, so consider going to a doctor and asking for a second opinion about a diagnosis. When you ask this, you're not asking the doctor what they believe, all things considered, where their beliefs might be uh, based on the testimony of other doctors. Rather, you're asking which diagnosis she thinks is best supported by some subset of her total evidence. Um, it may be that in the context of giving the second opinion, the doctor accepts the diagnosis of anemia, but she doesn't believe the diagnosis because she knows that her well-educated, well-informed colleagues do not think that it's anemia. Um, and so when she's in a different context, like if she's in conversation with her colleagues, she'll give up the commitment to anemia. You know? so, so that's the distinction between belief and acceptance. If that's right, it's not clear that expert autonomy helps to justify belief. Indeed, the appeal to expert autonomy is sort of a double-edged sword for anybody who believes a minority position. What's valuable about expert autonomy is that when a field respects expert autonomy, then when there is consensus, it's likely to be independent, um, or, or at least the experts have a kind of independence they would not otherwise have. Um, now, if I'm working in that field, then my own work should also be autonomous. So I should discount this consensus with respect to what I accept when I'm writing articles. But with respect to what I believe, uh, 
Well, now the consensus seems to provide an even stronger case for rejecting or at least suspending judgment about the minority position, right? So, so the, the very value of, of expert autonomy, um, you know, precisely because of its value, um, like the fact that there is a consensus is going to weigh against belief in the minority position. So that might be a problem for this response. Okay, let's turn to the third uh, sort of type of strategy for um, dealing with consensus uh, against one's position. And this is the, the explanation strategy. Now this strategy attempts to explain the philosophical consensus in a way which shows uh, the, the, why this consensus is wrong or unreliable. If I'm adopting this type of strategy, I will try to show that there is a relevant difference between myself and other philosophers, which explains why those other philosophers have gone wrong. So, I mean, so of course it's it's not enough to simply identify that there's some you know problem um, in in philosophy. Um, you know, I'm 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 going to need to sort of show that like these other philosophers have gone wrong, and that my own reasoning is not afflicted by this by this problem. Um, okay. Uh, so let's look at some potential explanations. There are many. There are many explanations that you know we might appeal to here. I'm just going to go through uh, a few possible ones, but I'm I'm sure you can come up with other potential explanations. Um, so this is just illustrative. Okay, first of all, I might appeal to uh, evidential superiority on my part. Um, I might say that I have access to evidence and arguments that these other philosophers have just not considered. Um, so they, they're working with inferior evidence, so it's not surprising that they reject the correct position. Um, now, obviously, if this were the case, it, it may well explain why uh, philosophers reject my position. Uh, but how often will this be the case? How often will this be true? Probably quite rarely. Um, probably quite rarely. Uh, after all, you know, if you like, it's, it's not generally going to be true um, when I hold a minority position, that this is just because I've come across, you know, evidence and arguments, or I've come up with things that um, all of these other philosophers have just failed to consider. Moreover, this problem is easily corrected. If I know that, um, or, or at least, you know, if I think I know of arguments that my colleagues have not yet encountered, well, I can just present those arguments, um, you know, and when I do this, will I find that those colleagues change their minds? Um, yeah. Probably not. You know, there aren't there aren't really uh, knockdown arguments in philosophy. You know, so even even when I do come up with a new argument for minority position, I wouldn't expect it to obliterate the opposition. Um, so yeah, I mean, this maybe isn't going to be uh, the most uh, plausible response in a lot of cases. Although maybe it will sometimes um, it will sometimes be a, an applicable response. So. Um, Brian Francis, in the previously mentioned article, distinguishes two kinds of epistemic superiority. So first, that we can say that with respect to some proposition P, I am an epistemic superior to almost all philosopher specialists who, who reject P. And second, we might say that with respect to P, I am an epistemic superior to almost all philosophers who reject P. So we can distinguish um, philosophers who are specialists with respect to P from philosophers in general with respect to P, you know. Um, so take take something like scientific anti-realism. Uh, most philosophers endorse scientific realism. Now, if I'm talking about philosophy in general, maybe I can say that I just have better evidence. I mean, this is one of my areas of specialization. I've thought about this in more detail than most other philosophers have. I've encountered more of the relevant arguments than most other philosophers have. So maybe, you know, if, I'm, if I was asked to explain, well, why the philosophers in general um, endorse scientific realism, maybe it would be a reasonable explanation to say, well, you know, they just haven't considered the, <laughs> the best arguments for it. Um, now, of course, uh, that would leave me with the problem that most specialists with respect to scientific realism also endorse scientific realism, um, and the appeal to inferior evidence isn't going to work there. Um, but the point is, you know, like, yeah, there, there will actually be cases where you may have, um, like, better evidence and better arguments, or you may be aware of more arguments than um, most philosophers or philosophers in general. Um, and so you might be able to explain consent my uh, the consensus against your position um, by appeal to inferior evidence uh, 
in those cases. Okay, a second type of explanation um, appeals to selection effects. Consider theism. If you look at the uh, Phil Paper's survey results for all of the respondents, only about 19% endorse theism. As, as we saw earlier, theism is a minority position. Um, and it's 67% for atheism. However, if you look at philosophers of religion specifically, so this is the field that specializes in the question of you know, theism. Uh, if you look at philosophers of religion specifically, theism jumps to about 69%. And atheism is the minority position with only about 20% endorsing it. That's a remarkable shift. That's a that's a big difference. Now, one explanation for this, of course, is just, well, there are very powerful arguments for theism that most philosophers are unaware of. So, you know, when philosophers go into philosophy of religion, they encounter these new brilliant arguments and they convert to theism. Obviously, if I'm an atheist, I'm not going to find that to be uh, an attractive explanation. An alternative explanation is that this is the product of a selection effect. It might be that the people who choose to do philosophy of religion tend to be more inclined towards theism in the first place. Um, indeed, it might be that one of their motivations for choosing philosophy of religion uh, is to learn how to defend theism better. So it's not that philosophy of religion produces theists. Right? It's not that you have you know, a bunch of people who you know, would like atheist or agnostic, and then they kind of go into philosophy of religion and they're converted on the basis of these powerful arguments. Rather, it's that theists are more likely to choose philosophy of religion. Um, I, you know, I, mean, I, I can say, like, as an atheist, I mean, I'm just, I don't know, I'm not that interested in arguments for and against God. I mean, it's a cool topic, don't get me wrong, and sometimes I do engage with it, but it's, it's, you know, it's not a debate that, like, really matters to me. I mean, I grew up in a very secular household. I don't know a lot of people who are openly religious. The question of God is just not a big part of my life. In fact, the only time when I ever think about God is when I do philosophy and on those occasions when I do philosophy of religion. That's it. Um, so, I mean, the point is, is just like a lot of atheists are just interested in other topics. You know, they've moved on to other topics. So this might explain why atheism is the minority position among philosophers of religion, right? Maybe it's not that there are powerful arguments, rather it's just a selection effect. Um, of course, notice that actually a theist might give the same explanation for philosophy in general, right? Maybe the reason why most philosophers are atheists is not that atheism is best supported by the arguments, but just that people, um, you know, maybe people choose to do philosophy partly because they are atheists, um, or maybe maybe the people ha like. Maybe the people, the kind of people who choose to do philosophy um, also tend to have commitments and attitudes that incline them towards atheism. You know, it's just like philosophy appeals to a certain type of person, right? It's going to appeal to people who are more, you know, sceptical, non-dogmatic, non-conformist, etc. Maybe people like that are less likely to endorse religion in the first place. Um, so, again, that might explain why theism is the minority position among philosophers in general. So, you know, they, theists can appeal to a selection effect as well. Um, okay, another uh, uh, explanation appeals to psychological bias. Consider free will. Why is the denial of free will a minority position? Well, maybe, uh, maybe it's because, you know, it, it really, like, free will matters to me. It really feels like I have free will. I feel like I'm in control of my own decisions. And that's an important part of my self-conception and my sense of the meaning and value of my life. You know, I can take pride in my achievements. I can feel regret about the mistakes I've made. I am the subject of praise and blame. But this is because my decisions were made freely. Um, I was in control of them, right? I am responsible for them, right? That's, that's, that's why, that's, that's what makes me the appropriate subject of praise and blame. That's what may, allows me to take pride in my achievements. If there's no sense in which I have control over my own actions or responsibility for my own actions, then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no better than a you know, speck of dust being pushed around by the wind. Uh, you know, I just sort of go wherever I'm, you know, where, wherever I'm, I'm pushed and, and there's like no way that I, there's no meaning or value to my existence. The point of all of this, of course, is that the concept of free will is kind of emotionally charged. Um, and so, you know, you might say that even if the arguments for denying free will were very powerful, uh, we would expect that it would be the minority position anyway.
um, because many people will be motivated to make any moves as they can to save the idea of free will. Um, so it, it like when there may be cases where you know we're dealing with topics that are emotionally charged and that biases people. Um, another example of this type of thing, um, consider political libertarianism. Robert Nozick wrote an article, uh, Why Do Intellectuals Oppose Capitalism?, um, which attempts to identify factors which bias uh, academics and other intellectuals against capitalism. I don't actually think, I don't think capitalism is the minority position, but it is true, um, certainly among philosophers at least, that um, you know, there are far more people endorsing socialism than uh, in the general population. Um, and, and I mean, you know, if you look specifically at libertarianism um, in politics, that is the minority position among philosophers. So anyway, um, some of Nozick's thoughts on this. Uh, so Nozick says, well, you know, this, this may well be a product of a kind of psychological bias. And there are two factors he points to. First of all, um, intellectuals are the kind of people who tend to succeed during their schooling, right? In the in the early years of their life and as they grow up and they're educated, they will gain a high status within their institutions. And if we look at people who are doing philosophy PhDs, I mean, you know, any, anybody who's been accepted onto a PhD program is going to have a, 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 a long record of academic success. You know, they will have succeeded every step of the way. They will likely have been at the top or close to the top of their class, you know, every step of the way. They will have been constantly praised and rewarded for their intellectual work. They will have received the highest grades. They will have been judged superior to all others. And as a result, um, these intellectuals often come to see themselves as among the most valuable members of their society. And they expect reward in accordance with their intellectual status. Um, you know, th that's what they've experienced, right? Like they have so far, right, they have been judged to be the most valuable and they have been rewarded in accordance with that. And they expect society in general to operate with similar norms. But capitalism, of course, doesn't reward intellectual activity, at least not directly. Um, you know, uh, very often people who are like, you know, you can, you can do something like a philosophy PhD and succeed at it very well. And then that, that just doesn't bring you any reward in, in the long term. I mean, um, or at least it brings you relatively little, um, you know, you're not necessarily going to get uh, the best job. Um, it, you're going to, you're going to struggle when you try to go out and, you know, go in a different direction with your career, etc. Um, so the point is that this feeling that I am special and I deserve reward for my intellectual talents. That confronts the reality of capitalist society where in fact people you know, aren't rewarded in that kind of way and that leads to resentment. Um, so intellectuals feel resentful against capitalism and that biases them against it. Um, second, Nozick points out that in academia rewards for intellectual achievement are often distributed by a central authority, usually the teacher. So intellectuals spend a significant part of their lives in this system with a centrally organized mechanism for distributing rewards. And this system benefits them. You know, this system benefits the intellectuals. This leads the intellectual to favor this kind of structure. You know, they, they feel positively towards sort of central organization or central distribution mechanisms. Nozick sees an analogy between the central authority of the classroom and central planning in socialist states. Um, and so because intellectuals have existed in, you know, this kind of analogous system, they're going to be more positively disposed to central planning than to the chaotic free market. So opposition to capitalism among philosophers um, is, you know, again, it's, uh, we, it's not that the arguments against it are so strong, it's that the specific social institutions in which academics work and the, you know, the way that academic reward is distributed, that biases academically successful people against capitalism. Okay, a fourth uh, type of explanation uh, that we might use to defend minority positions is we might uh, appeal to unreliable methods. We might say that a particular philosophical consensus has occurred because the most philosophers are using methods that are unreliable, right? Um, so it's, it's not surprising that um, they would end up, you know, forming a consensus on the wrong position. Uh, so uh, one example of this might be that philosophers often appeal to intuition to defend their theories. Um, in things like the method of cases and reflective equilibrium, we test 
particular philosophical theories against our intuitive judgments. And intuition is a kind of intellectual seeming. Uh, so with some propositions, you know, you have a, a kind of immediate reaction to them where they seem to be true or they seem to be false. Uh, that's an intuition. Um, philosophers test their theories against intuitions. If I propose a moral theory, say, you know, utilitarianism, you might try to show that it has counterintuitive consequences in particular cases. So you might say, well, if utilitarianism were true, then it would be okay to kill one person, steal his organs to save five. But our intuition is that that's clearly morally repugnant. So utilitarianism isn't true. I mean, you know, hopefully you're familiar with this, right, with this style of argument, right? So, you know, somebody proposes a particular moral principle, right, and then we imagine some case or we describe some scenario in which that principle has counterintuitive consequences, and that's taken to be um, uh, a, maybe not a decisive argument, but it's taken to be a consideration against that principle. Um, or consider Gettier cases in epistemology. So we have the proposal that knowledge is justified true belief. Then uh, Ed Gettier comes along and presents a couple of cases in which a person has justified true belief, but intuitively they don't have knowledge. Um, an example of a Gettier case, although this isn't actually one of the Gettier cases that Gettier gives, uh, it's a simpler one. So imagine that I go downstairs in the morning, I look at the clock, it says 8 a.m. Uh, well, okay, it looks like I'm justified in believing that it's 8am. I mean, you know, forming one's beliefs about the time on the basis of what the clock says, that, that usually works. Um, and moreover, suppose that it's true that it's 8am. So I have a justified true belief that it is currently 8am. But now suppose that the, cl the clock had actually stopped the night before. It just so happened to stop at 8 o'clock. Uh, well, intuitively, I don't know that it's 8am. I have a justified true belief, but intuitively, I don't have knowledge. So knowledge isn't justified true belief, uh, or at least that provides some consideration against the analysis of knowledge as justified true belief. And what I'm doing here is, you know, I'm, I'm testing my theory of knowledge against my intuitions. I've proposed some principle, some analysis of knowledge, right? And then I'm imagining various different cases and seeing if that gets us the right result in those cases. This is a very common kind of argument. Uh, philosophers are, are constantly uh, appealing to their intuitions to, you know, defend or attack particular philosophical theories. But intuition is very controversial. There's a lot of debate about in what circumstances, if any, intuition is a reliable guide to the facts. I have a couple of videos on intuition, which I will link in the comments. So I'm, I'm not going to go through those criticisms here because, you know, that's a whole other video. But Suffice it to say, right, there are a lot of philosophers who will say that this method is just unreliable, um, or at least there are many contexts, many of the situations in which philosophers appeal to intuition, right, intuition is just not a reliable guide to anything. Um, so this point actually also overlaps with selection effects and bias, because even if you think that intuition can be reliable, one of the problems with philosophers appealing to intuition is that our intuitions may be heavily dependent on cultural background, education, and, you know, just sort of personal psychological idiosyncrasies. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work in experimental philosophy where uh, philosophers go out and survey people and study their intuitions, and uh, there's evidence that there's actually quite a lot of variation in intuitions. If you present people in other societies with cases relating to free will or, you know, knowledge or meta-ethics, they don't actually seem to share the intuitions of philosophers. At least that's what some evidence uh, suggests. Um, so the vast majority of philosophical literature is coming from, um, from, from weird populations. Weird as in Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic, right? It's that very specific types um, of, of people are producing uh, academic philosophy. And then from those populations, only a very specific type of person is going to enter academic philosophy in the first place. So, th so right there is a selection effect. Um, and then when we think about, you, you know, w when we do philosophy, when we learn philosophy, we're learning to think about problems in a very specific way. You know, we're taught what types of questions are important, how to think about those questions. And we talk mainly amongst ourselves, you know, philosophers, when they, when they are talking about their intuitions or, or whatever, you know, that they, they will be talking to other philosophers. Um, so we're a bunch of very unusual people talking mainly to, 
a bunch of other very unusual people. Um, and everybody who specialises in philosophy, uh, everybody who specialises in philosophy has sort of gone through a filter, kind of, you know, so, and, and that's going to influence the pattern of intuitions. There's a very specific type of person who ends up specialising in philosophy. Um, and it may be that the intuitions that philosophers have um, are just not representative of, like, people's intuitions in general. Moreover, of course, my intuitions are likely to be influenced by my my personality, my emotional dispositions, my self-interest. I mean, I can imagine somebody like Nozick saying, yeah, well, of course you're going to have anti-capitalist intuitions. That's because you've developed this emotional resentment to capitalism. You know, so, um, so, so yeah, I mean, even if there are uh, situations in which intuition is a reliable guide, um, there might be a worry that you know, that, that, that our intuitions, that philosophers' intuitions are just completely unrepresentative and, again, like, influenced by bias and so on um, because of... Yeah, so, it's, it, again, we have this problem of selection effect and bias. So, um, the point of all of this is, if intuition is unreliable and if the consensus is a product of philosophers testing their theories against intuition, well, that would explain why philosophers have gone wrong. Um, so what we've what we can do here is identify a particular method that philosophers are using that has um, you know, resulted in the mistaken consensus. Now, of course, anybody giving this explanation for a mistaken consensus will need to use different methods in their own work, and you know that may, might be where the difficulty is. Uh, you know, like okay, so right, what's the alternative? Right, what are the altern what what are you using to defend the position that you have come to? Right, if you're not. Um, you know, testing it against your intuitions, right? What's your method, right? Um, so this is going to be a general issue for explanations appealing to faulty methods. You're going to have to propose uh, an alternative method. Um, right, okay, well, you know, that's uh, that's the end of that. Um, uh, I have nothing more to say for, for now. So thanks for watching, and uh, I, I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.